So here we have two engines made from the same parts. They have the same crankshaft, the same connecting rod, the same wrist pin, and the same pest. The only difference between them is that in this engine, the cylinder center is slightly offset from the crankshaft center, whereas in this engine, they are perfectly aligned. If you observe these two engines in operation, they seem to be doing the same thing. The crankshaft rotates, the piston reciprocates, and the connecting rod, well, the connecting rod does its own thing. But this similarity is nothing other than an illusion, because due to that little bit of cylinder offset, these two engines are fundamentally different. The offset changes everything. It impacts power and efficiency as well as engine size. It dramatically upsets engine balance, and it even disrupts the duration of the piston strokes. And in this video, we'll explain how, and more importantly, why all of this happens. And this will then explain why many modern engines employ a cylinder offset configuration. We'll start easy and then gradually increase the level of mind-bogglingness until you get completely sick and tired of looking at these two engines and close the video. Let's see how long you can last. Let's start easy. The offset cylinder engine makes more power and is more efficient. Why? Well, let's imagine that both pistons are just a bit past the start of the combustion vent. So we have combustion pressure building inside the chamber, resulting in massive forces pushing down on the piston. But the piston is obviously connected to the crankshaft via a connecting rod, which means that the piston also pushes down on the rod, and then the rod pushes down on the crankshaft. The problem lies in the fact that the rod is inclined at a certain angle. The downward force exerted on the rod is directed at the small end of the rod, meaning that this force is actually trying to spin the rod, or flip it over, if you will. As the rod tries to flip over, it ends up pushing the piston against the cylinder wall, which increases friction. The sharper the angle of the rod, the harder the rod pushes the piston into the cylinder wall and the greater the friction. Reduced friction means that the less of the energy generated by the engine gets wasted on friction, which means that there is more available to be converted into usable work, aka power. Next, let's talk about engine size. Now, Yamaha on their website claimed that a offset cylinder engine is more compact. Now, if you observe our two example engines, you can see that they're pretty much of the same size. In fact, the offset cylinder engine is a bit wider overall due to the offset. So why did Yamaha say this? Well, the trick is that if you want to reduce friction on a zero offset engine, then you have no other choice but to increase the rod length. A longer rod results in a reduced rod angle, which then reduces friction, but it also makes the engine taller overall. So what Yamaha was basically trying to say is that a offset cylinder engine enables the same friction reduction without an increase in engine height. Now let's address something that you probably already noticed. The offset cylinder engine has a slightly longer stroke. How is this possible if the crankshafts are the same? As we know, an engine stroke, or the distance the piston covers from top dead center to bottom dead center and vice versa, is determined by the length of the crankshaft throw, or the distance between the center of the main journal and the center of the rod journal. This distance determines the diameter of the imaginary circle drawn by the crankshaft during engine rotation, and an engine stroke ends up being the distance between these two points. So if these two crankshafts are the same, why does the piston cover a greater distance in the offset engine? Well, the answer is that on the zero offset engine, the bottommost point or bottom dead center that the piston reaches is this point. On the offset engine, bottom dead center is here. As you can see, the line which connects the crankshaft with the piston is obviously longer in the case of the offset engine because this line is at an angle. Now, what connects the piston to the crankshaft is obviously the connecting rod, which means that in order to retain the same stroke, the offset engine would have to employ a slightly longer rod. If you keep rod length the same, it means that this line is forced to become shorter, which pulls down the piston an additional distance, which increases stroke. 
we usually associate increased stroke with increased engine torque output. And this is because increased stroke is a consequence of a longer crankshaft throw. And a longer crankshaft throw means that combustion pressures in the piston act on the crankshaft center with more leverage, which should in theory increase the torque output. However, as you have seen in this case, we have not manipulated the crank throw length and therefore the increased stroke doesn't really influence the torque output. However, what may favorably influence torque output in the offset cylinder engine is that the connecting rod acts on the crankshaft at a slightly more favorable angle, which depending on the particular engine, its specifics and its anatomy may slightly increase the torque output. Next, let's talk about the individual engine strokes. So intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. The situation is very clear in the zero offset engine. And as we can observe, the engine completes one stroke or one piston top to bottom slash bottom to top during 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation. In other words, uh, from zero to 180 uh, degrees, the engine completes intake. From 180 to 360, the engine does compression. From 360 to 540, the engine does combustion. And from 540 to 720, the engine does exhaust. Pretty simple. But things are obviously very different in our offset engine. The first issue is that zero degrees of crankshaft rotation is no longer top dead center. So we're going to zoom in on our little 3D model while at the same time modifying crankshaft rotation degrees so that we can find the true top dead center value of our engine. Okay, so let's start with one degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and there we have it. There we have it. At 10 degrees, the piston starts going down, which means that at nine degrees of engine rotation, we have our top dead center. Now let's zoom in again and do the same thing for bottom dead center. Because we're starting from nine instead of zero, we will rotate the engine to 189 degrees to see if we are at bottom dead center. And as you can see, 180 degrees of rotation does not bring us to bottom dead center in the case of the offset cylinder engine, which means that now 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation does not complete a piston stroke. So let's enter progressively higher numbers until we actually get to bottom dead center. Let's try 195, um, nope, 198, okay, close, 199, 200, 201, 202, 203, and there we go. At 203 degrees of engine rotation, the piston starts going up again, which means that 202 degrees is our bottom dead center. So if top dead center is nine degrees and bottom dead center is 202 degrees, it means that top to bottom or a single engine stroke now requires 193 degrees of engine rotation instead of 180 as we're used to. In other words, intake and combustion now have a duration of 193 degrees of engine rotation. What happens with compression and exhaust? Do they also take 193 degrees? Of course not. An engine is a fixed mechanical linkage and a full circle of rotation must equal 360 degrees, which means that compression and exhaust have no choice but to last 167 degrees instead. So how did this happen? Well, to understand that, we first must observe the zero offset engine. And uh, as we have said, the connecting rod is what connects the piston to the crankshaft. And the connecting rod is essentially a line. The absolute length of that line, of course, never changes. The length of the rod stays the same. However, the relative length of that line changes. Its length in relation to the piston and crankshaft center line changes as the engine is running. As we can see at top and bottom dead center, the rod or the line is fully upright. At 90 and 270 degrees of rotation, the rod is fully inclined. And a line fully upright is longer than that same line at an angle. So if the relative length changes, then it must mean that the distance between the piston and the crank center also changes and thus the angling of the rod brings the piston and the crankshaft closer and further apart. The only reason we cannot see that or perceive it with our eyes because we cannot perceive different sources of movements. Our, our eyes only see a single movement. But the angling of the rod is effectively disrupting the distance between the piston and the crankshaft. 
Let's observe a specific instance to see what happens. Going from 0 to 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation, we can see that the connecting rod is transitioning from fully upright to fully angled. This means that it's becoming shorter, or in other words, it pulls the piston down towards the crankshaft, while at the same time, the piston is going down as a part of its regular motion. This means that the connecting rod is doing the same thing as the crankshaft, pulling the piston down. And what the crankshaft is doing is causing the piston to travel a certain distance within its stroke. So if the connecting rod is doing the same thing, then it must mean that it's adding distance or causing the piston to travel an additional distance within its stroke. And in fact, this is true. Our non-offset engine has a stroke of 72 millimeters. Looking at the engine with the naked eye, it seems that 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation should correspond to half the piston stroke. In other words, at 90 degrees, the piston should cover 36 millimeters of stroke distance. But if we actually rotate the engine to 90 degrees and inspect and measure the distance covered by the piston, we will see that the piston covers 43.5 millimeters of stroke distance. The extra 7.5 millimeters of travel are a consequence of the rod becoming inclined and pulling the piston down. Now, if we observe the engine from 90 to 180 degrees of rotation, we can see that the piston continues moving down and the connecting rod transitions from fully angled to fully upright once again. This means that the connecting rod is now becoming longer in relation to the piston and the crankshaft. It's in fact pushing the piston up. In other words, the connecting rod is doing the opposite thing from the crankshaft, which means that the connecting rod is taking away stroke distance. The distance taken away from 90 to 180 equals the distance added by the rod during rotation from 0 to 90 degrees. So it all adds up and the piston ends up at bottom dead center instead of going past it. So things are, let's say, pretty symmetric in the zero offset engine. The rod is fully upright at 0 and 180 and fully angled at 90 and 270 degrees of engine rotation. But if we employ a offset cylinder geometry, we disrupt the relationship between the rod and the stroke distance covered by the piston. This happens because the cylinder offset influences how much and where the rod angles during engine rotation. We can observe this uh, in the offset engine going from 0 to 90 degrees of engine rotation. The rod remains largely vertical. It has reduced deviation compared to the rod in the zero offset engine. Reduced deviation means less rod angle and therefore less influencing over the stroke distance covered by the piston. We can even measure this. If we rotate the offset engine to 90 degrees, we can see that the piston only goes 41.3 millimeters down the bore. This is less than what the piston covers for the first 90 degrees of rotation in the zero offset engine. Continuing from 90 degrees to bottom dead center, the rod still remains pretty vertical, and then only in very near bottom dead center, it assumes a somewhat sharper angle. But this angle still isn't as sharp as the sharpest angle that the rod assumes in the zero offset engine. This means that overall, going from top to bottom dead center in the offset engine, the rod does not contribute as much to the stroke distance covered by the piston. And then the crankshaft has to for lack of a better word, make up for the reduced rod involvement and rotate more degrees to get the piston to bottom dead center. But going from bottom to top dead center, we can see that the offset nature of the engine results in the rod assuming a very sharp angle. And then after that, the rod starts transitioning from this very sharp angle into fully upright. In other words, the rod becomes longer, noticeably longer, which means that it pushes the piston up as the piston is traveling upward anyway. So the rod is doing some work for the crankshaft now. And this means that the reduced rod involvement from top the bottom dead center gets balanced out by the increased rod involvement from bottom to top dead center which means that the crankshaft now has to do less work to get the piston to top that center. Hence, the different number of degrees for different engine strokes.
It also has to be noted that because the offset engine has a longer combustion stroke and a shorter compression stroke, it has more time to harness the energy of combustion and it spends less time wasting the energy on compression. Now, the difference between the strokes is minimal and it's actually exaggerated for demonstration purposes on our little 3D models, but even this slight little difference in the strokes still contributes a bit to the overall improved efficiency for the offset cylinder engine. Now we enter the final frontier, engine balance. If you do a bit of research online on offset cylinder engines, you will see how their proponents usually only list the benefits without mentioning any drawbacks. And to an extent that's understandable because a four-page article or a two-hour press release about engine balance would be considered a PR failure. So the cumulative result of all of this is that many people have been convinced that offset cylinders are only good, there's no drawbacks, and some even go as far as to call it free power. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as free power, there's no such thing as free lunches, there's always a price to be paid. And the price that the offset cylinder engine pays for its increased power and efficiency is engine balance. Both primary and secondary engine balance become much more difficult and more complicated to deal with in an offset cylinder engine. First, the easy bit, primary balance. As we know, a piston has mass and a piston rapidly moves up and down in the cylinder and changes direction, which means that it's constantly accelerating and decelerating as the engine is running, which means that the piston is of course exerting forces on the engine as it's running and changing direction. And these forces can be pretty massive because the piston, although it doesn't have much of a mass, it moves very, very quickly. So we have big acceleration, relatively small mass, but the resulting forces can be very big. Now, because the piston moves very fast, we feel these forces as vibrations, and these are called primary vibrations. Now, uh, if these forces are left unbalanced, then all of them are exerted onto the engine, and if they are high enough, they can range from engine damaging to mildly annoying if they are only partially balanced. Now, uh, when the piston goes towards top dead center, as you can see, it's decelerating, then comes to a very brief stop, and then it strongly accelerates down from top dead center which means that the primary force exerted on the engine at top dead center, it points upward because right at the moment as the piston comes to top dead center, it then suddenly changes direction. The same thing happens at bottom dead center. It's coming to bottom dead center, decelerating, exerts a massive downward force and then changes direction. You can even experience this with your hand, just take an object and try to rapidly move its direction of travel and you'll see that there's a, a force exerted on your hand as you try to change the direction of the object. Now, uh, at top and bottom dead center, we can use the crankshaft counterweight to partially balance out these forces created by the piston because at top and bottom dead center, the crankshaft counterweight in a zero offset engine is directly opposing the piston, so it can, it can only partially balance it out. But if we observe this uh, offset cylinder engine, we can see that neither at top nor bottom dead center, the crankshaft counterweight no longer directly opposes the piston, which means that balancing things out becomes much more difficult because the crankshaft counterweight is no longer a useful tool to restore primary balance. Now, you may be thinking that if the crankshaft isn't pointing in the correct direction at bottom and top dead center, why don't we just cast or forge the crankshaft differently so that the counterweight does indeed point in the correct direction at top and bottom dead center? Sure, we can do that. And now the crankshaft counterweight points up and the piston points down at bottom dead center. And although they're pointing in the correct directions, you have an offset between them, the distance of the cylinder offset, which means that now instead of balancing each other out, the counterweight and the piston are trying to flip the engine over, which means that again you have balance issues and vibrations. Now perfect primary balance can be achieved with an offset cylinder engine, of course it can, otherwise they wouldn't be in production, but it requires additional effort, either in the form of uh, balance shafts or offset weight uh, flywheels or crankshaft pulleys or possibly other unconventional balancing methods, but all of this is additional engineering, complexity, effort, time, money. 
Next up, secondary balance. Remember how we said that the angling of the connecting rod creates these little additional distances that the piston covers within the stroke? As we know, when the engine is running, time is also passing, so we have time and we have distance. That means that there must be some speed at which the piston is crossing these little additional distances. Now the connecting rod is also constantly changing its angle when the engine is running, which means that we have constant changes in speed. And if we have a change in speed, then we have an acceleration. And as we said, the piston has a mass, so we have acceleration and we have mass, which means that the angling of the connecting rod produces little forces during these little additional stroke distances. Of course, because these distances are much smaller than the main stroke distance covered by the piston. These little forces, secondary forces, are much smaller than the primary forces, but they exist. And if the piston mass is large, or in other words, if the engine displacement is large enough, then these forces can be significant, very noticeable, and very annoying, and must be balanced out. Now, the situation in the zero offset engine is pretty clear when it comes to secondary forces. Going from top dead center to 90 degrees, the rod becomes shorter, it pulls the piston down. Therefore, secondary force points down. Going from 90 to bottom dead center, the rod is becoming longer, it pushes the piston up, and so secondary force points up. From bottom dead center to 270 degrees, the rod is again becoming shorter, force points down. And from 270 to top dead center, rod becomes longer again, so force points up. If you want it on a graph, it looks like this. It's a pretty straightforward oscillating line and as such it can be balanced out pretty easily using balancing shafts that generate forces which oppose the secondary forces and cancel out the vibrations. But if we move over to the offset cylinder engine, we can see that nothing is straightforward anymore. First the rod briefly pushes the piston up, then it starts pulling it down, then stabilizes at this angle, then it again briefly pushes the piston up, and then finally a slightly larger downward pull, followed by a brief stabilization, and then a big upward push. As you can see, this is a very different graph compared to the one from the zero offset engine, and balancing out the secondary forces in an offset cylinder engine is much more difficult. So the irregular rod deviation basically creates secondary balance complexities for the offset cylinder engines. But this weird rod deviation or the lack thereof creates a final very important benefit for the offset engine. Now if we observe the two engines side by side we can see that in the zero offset engine starting from top dead center the rod gets quickly angled so it pulls the piston down the bore a bit faster. But in the offset cylinder engine the lack of rod deviation means that the piston gets pulled down the bore a bit slower. In other words it spends more time in the area right after top dead center. And as we know this is exactly where the piston finds itself after, after combustion begins. It means that the piston has a longer dwell time at top dead center in the offset cylinder engine and this gives the engine more room to harness the energy created by combustion. Now this becomes especially important at very high RPMs where the time window for harnessing combustion energy becomes extremely short and this is why many high revving machines like the Yamaha R1 or the Ninja ZX-10R have offset cylinder engines. And there you have it. If you made it this far and haven't just clicked to this point in the video, then you are an absolute legend. Uh, I have to say that after so many engine balance videos, I am beyond overjoyed to see that so many people share the passion for these seemingly simple, but in reality, very interesting and somewhat mesmerizing concepts hidden inside engines. So as always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.